All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm TJ Schultz. I'm president of the Airport Consultants Council. I'm the director of the Security Manufacturers Co Coalition. And I'm also the staff liaison for the ACC Security Committee. We are very pleased to have this uh, informational webinar offered by National Safe Skies Alliance. We enjoy a very, very good partnership with Safe Skies and know a lot of our members do as well. And um, in particular, we're very active in the Paris program. And uh, it's just remarkable to see what started as a glimmer in the eyes of Charles Chambers, how much it has grown and has become a trusted resource for the aviation industry and all of us involved in airport security and safety. Um, so what an incredible legacy. And uh, today uh, we're going to focus on one piece of research that has always been in the interest of the broader airport development community, and that's the uh, security guidelines. Uh, and we'll get into some history and uh, of the report and get some general information on that. Uh, so thank you all for participating. As far as some logistics, uh, feel free to use the chat function to say hi to your friends or uh, say hi to everyone else. Uh, if you have any specific questions, use the Q&A function, and we'll kind of take a look here and suss through those um, at the end or as they come in. Um, I think that's about it. So with that, let me introduce our fearless security committee leader, uh, Cassie Beamer. Welcome, Cassie. Thank you. Hey, everyone. I uh, hope you're having a lovely Friday. Um, so when we started the security committee this year, um, I'm the chair and, and uh, John Stone from Lidos is the vice chair. Um, when, when we kind of sat down and, and tried to map out the plan for the security committee, um, uh, one of our goals was that our, our friends over at Safe Skies had a platform um, to be reaching this group on some kind of recurring basis uh, with different topics that were of interest to the members. And um, I think that you found that in our regular committee meetings this year, we've had a portion of the agenda dedicated to Safe Skies updates. And um, this is another part of that, the extension of that, that partnership with the committee and Safe Skies. And um, so we're just thrilled to have this opportunity for this webinar today. I think it's timely information for the committee. Um, Jess Grizzle is, is primarily the one we hear from, and she's been a wealth of information. Um, so thank you, Jess. I think, Jess, you're kicking it off, um, but I would be remiss to not um, introduce my my mentor and hero in personal and professional things, uh, Charlotte Peed. Um, and um, anyone who knows me knows that if Charlotte Peed asks me to walk across the desert barefoot, I say, okay. Um, so when Charlotte Peed said, let's, um, let's add Safe Skies to the security committee agenda, and, uh, I said, yes, ma'am. Um, so I would just be remiss by not, not um, saying hello to Charlotte. Um, but um, I think we have an amazing panel today and they're, they're um, gonna give you a lot of information. So with that, Jess, I think I'll kick it all over to you. Yeah, thanks so much, Cassie. And just, I'll do some really quick introductions of our panel so that everyone understands the perspectives that they're bringing to the conversation. So first I'll start with Jeremy Martell. Jeremy is gonna bring over 30 years of aviation experience in both civil and military aviation operations uh, to our conversation. And that includes a career in the Air Force as well as serving as a manager of operations and security for the Albany International Airport. Um, in his current position as CHA's Northeast Aviation Design Leader, he's responsible for leading a team of engineers and CHA's um, aviation design practice in the Northeast. Um, in addition to airport design, his experience includes airport management, security and ops, general and commercial aviation finance activities, and airport business development and airport design. So welcome, Jeremy. Um, next, we have Josh Cousins. Josh is an Assistant Chief of Police for the Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport um, Department of Public Safety. Josh has been with DFW since 2010 and is currently in command of over 100 uniformed police officers of the patrol division and is tasked with overseeing the department's specialized crime deterrence team, crime scene investigations unit, and the department honor guard. So Josh has a master's in security studies, um, also holds the ACE uh, security accreditation through AAAE, and is an alumnus of the Southern Police Institute and Leadership North Texas University. And finally, um, our fearless leader on Paris 28 was Renee Reeder. 
Uh, Renee is the aviation security leader for Burns Engineering and principal investigator for Parish 28. Um, Renee has over 25 years of experience in planning, development, design, project management, installation, and commissioning of complex enterprise security systems for aviation clients. Um, he is a certified protection professional and physical security professional with ASIS and a certified airport security coordinator with AAAE. So that is a lot of experience to bring to the table. And so we're really happy to have this panel and uh, thank them for joining us. So before we get started talking about this version of Paris 28, just want to give you a little bit of background of how we got here. So as most of you know, this is the sixth iteration of the document started back in 1996 with FAA, um, was released two versions with FAA, went to TSA for two versions, then came to Safe Skies for the last version, which was Paris 4, and now here we are at the sixth iteration of 28. So a lot has changed in those 25 years, and I think one of the biggest changes is that there are several standalone documents now that cover what used to be sections in this um, guidelines document. So when the panel got together back in 2019 to determine what is going to be the scope and objective of Parish 28, they said, you know what, more than just an update, we probably need a revision to reflect where we are now versus where we were 25 years ago when this document started. And so we issued the RFP to get that revision to the document and Burns Engineering was selected with Renee Reeder as the principal investigator. So I will pause now and turn it over to Renee to talk about this new version of the document, how it came together and really how it's intended to be used. And then we'll continue the conversation from there. Renee. Great, thanks Jessica and good morning or good afternoon to everyone on the line. Um, absolutely honored to be part of this panel um, and to be here today speaking about the, the work that our team put together in, in putting together this revision. Um, I, I do want to take a pause. This, like Jessica said, this is version six of a document that's been alive forever. Um, so I do want to give a shout out to a lot of the original authors of, of the earlier versions because they really set the groundwork for where we took this document to that next level. Um, so as Jessica was saying, I, I've been in this industry for a long time. Um, I remember having the FAA um, version of this document that was earmarked, tagged, highlighted, um, and I carried it everywhere with me. You know, that, that was, the, <clears throat> that was the, the Bible um, that had everything in it that when I had clients question or, or, or ask something for clarification, I could pull it out and point, point to that reference. So when Burns was selected for this, we, we knew we were taking on a huge responsibility and, um, you know, we wanted to make sure that we, we presented a document back to the industry that reflected where we are today um, as an industry, especially in aviation security, um, and providing a document that, that complements um, what a lot of our partners out there um, with our three-letter agencies have already developed as standalone reports. So. Um, what we did was when we when we took took a look at this project and we started working on it, we wanted to take a look at and see, you know, who who really are the intended users? What is our what is our focus core group in this? And what, what we wanted to where we ended up settling on <clears throat> is that this document is is not necessarily for the <clears throat> for the person just joining aviation security, uh, but really someone who's at that point in career where they they need that refresher. Um, for the airports or airline security directors who may not have been through a capital project in their career, um, knew the words, knew the terms, may not have known the process. Um, so to kind of help them frame that aspect of it. For our, our architectural and engineering community, looking at it from the perspective of, you know, how do you put together an integrated security package and what does that look like? What are the references you need to pull together and, and, and put together into a detailed security design package? So what, what you'll see is we, we've sort of rejigged the entire document into three primary sections um, that where we open up with planning the security design. And in that section, we, we really start talking about the background information about what should start an AVSEC security design process. So looking at developing project definitions, going through a threat and vulnerability assessment and blast assessments, looking at developing that basis of design, which then sets your criteria for how you're gonna move, move forward um, through the development of the project. The second major section starts talking about the security system design specifically. 
And what we did was we broke it down into several subsections um, and you'll see it's broken up into physical and electronic and then operational and monitoring sessions. And then we start talking about the other systems that impact security. So baggage, checkpoints, IT, um, and then ultimately a coordination section. One of, one of the aspects that we realized as we were developing this document and speaking with um, past users of the document during the information gathering is that really having a centralized coordination point. Um, because what we found was is that a lot of change orders were resulting on projects and clients by missing sort of simple, um, a simple checklist of what they should be looking at when they're picking up the design. So we included that in the back end of the section. And then probably the, I think the one of the, the bigger um, significant edits to this document is, is the third section is, is construction and handover. So in that it's really looking at, you know, what does security need to look like during construction? How do you go through a testing process? You know, what is the operational readiness look like? And what does the final handover um, look like at the end of the project? So our goal was, was to provide that sort of 360 perspective from, um, from birth to death of what a project would look like and how things get pulled together um, for developing an overall security program. A couple of things that you'll notice, um, again, in comparison to some of the older documents, um, we wanted to streamline sort of the primary sections of the report. So what we didn't want to do was have <clears throat> people who are potentially knowledgeable with for example, definitions or background information to have to stream through that in the front end of the report. So we pulled a lot of that good core information out into the appendix section. So the information still exists, but we pulled it out more as, as separate relevant documents as opposed to being um, intertwined within the overall guidance and suggestions on how to develop the security design programs. The other thing that you'll, you'll see is that we, we looked at this document that you know, again, from where I started out with this version um, on the FAA one, where I earmarked and printed and had hard copies of everything, we assume that most users of this document would use it electronically. So not only do we have all of the websites embedded into the document itself, but we also, there is um, a larger version of the document hosted on a SharePoint site that you can download from Safe Skies that has the actual documents embedded into the guideline itself. So if you're out at a construction site with limited bandwidth or limited network connectivity, all of that is all embedded within the report. So you don't have to worry about it and can operate in a completely standalone fashion. Um, some graphical stuff that we played with, um, you know, we looked at trying to make the document more readable um, so that if you're in the middle of the report, you always have the ability to tab back to the front sections. It, it's little things like that we tried to be aware of um, so that when users of this document, because we were taking such a, um, a relatively radical redevelopment of a, of a report that's been around for a very long time, we wanted to make sure it was as user-friendly as possible. Um, so that's why we included, included a lot of those um, automated tabs that you'll see on the side of the document that will point you back to the major sections. Um, you know, I, I think the, the biggest thing that we really tried to do with this document was eliminate a lot of redundancy. Um, so if there was, and, and I'll, pick, I'll pick on the TSA a bit. Um, so Dale Mason and his design guidelines, great document. There's no reason to duplicate any of that information in this version. Um, so you'll see in the checkpoint section, we have a, a very short blur about what a checkpoint is, but then we point right to that TSA document. There's no reason to have, you know, versions of documents that could potentially be out of date um, and it also provides an easier life cycle management of this report so that if there is an update to, for example, the TSA guideline, instead of rewriting the whole section, we're just changing a link. Um, so it will also help ensuring that this document stays uh, relatively more alive and more accurate um, than it might have been in, in prior versions. So um, I will say on behalf of Burns, we're, we're absolutely honored to um, you know, lead this project and take on this opportunity. Um, you know, I think it's a great document, you know, hopefully it, it's, it's done justice um, to, again, the, the original editors of it, um, you know, and, and, and I'll say we're, we're not shy for feedback. So, you know, I'm sure if Jessica got stuff or if uh, you came back to us and say you're absolutely ridiculous or good work, um, you know, we take the good and the bad, um, you know, as, as, a, as sort of a, a key member of, of this industry and making sure we have something that's very relevant and very valuable um, to everyone out there. So thanks, Jessica. I'll turn it back to you. 
Yeah, thanks so much for that, Renee. I think that was a really good overview of how we got to this version. And so I want to come to the other panel members now, uh, Josh and Jeremy, to talk a little bit about, you know, how are the this document and other documents like this, how are these used in the industry? How do they fit in your roles? Do they I wonder if they constrain you in any way or if they enable you to be more creative by just sort of giving you a baseline and letting you take it from there. And, you know, what what benefit do documents like these provide to you? So, Jeremy, I'll come to you first. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. You know, I've been able to be on both sides, you know, on the uh, airport owner side and also on the uh, on the, the the consultant side of things. And. One of the one of the things when we were first going into this, I, I really thought that a document like this could be used um, not only to bolster the. Uh, I'm sorry, I have something going off here. My apologies. Um, we have a, uh, we had to be able to use it on both both sides of the uh, uh, of the uh, the equation. You know from. From the operator side, sometimes when you're you're at that mid-level management um, and you're trying to bring uh, requirements uh, that are either required under 1542 or um, to uh, to leadership at the airport, and then trying to explain some of these things to a board that may have uh, folks that aren't as uh, understanding of the requirements, this document helps bolster that and provides. A uh, kind of a guidance, and I know when we first started looking at this, uh, we wanted to make sure that it was a readable document that um, everybody could could have an understanding on. So I think that's that's important from from that perspective is just being able to use it and being able to uh, to provide um, backup and guidance on uh, from a from an airport operator side. Yeah, thanks for that, Jeremy. Josh, wondering what your thoughts are on that from an airport perspective and a public safety perspective. How do documents like this fit into your role and how do you use them or find benefit in them? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Jess. Uh, first off, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here on the panel. Uh, I want to start off by commending Renee and the Burns team. Um, I mean, they really brought this document into the 21st century. Um, previous revisions of this document. As Renee said, it, it's a, a pretty uh, old document that's been uh, providing information for airports for, for quite a while now, but every revision just sem seemed to add more and more meat to the, the document that in, in some cases weren't technically necessary. Uh, so now that you know we're in the 24th century, we have the ability to uh, put these documents on tablets and laptops and hyperlink them to other documentation. Uh, really kind of streamlined and, and slimmed down this document to more usability and, and, and more user friendly. Uh, so, so great job on that. Um, to your question, uh, Jess, really, you know, in airport policing, we're, we're constantly looking at resource management. Uh, we're looking at force multiplication. So anywhere we can increase security uh, through design and planning is really beneficial to us. So, you know, we, we constantly look at airports as, as targets to crime and terrorism. And that's that's really where this document is going is, is how do we protect ourselves from that? Uh, so we wanna include as many you know, security features as possible to, to passively protect and harden that target without having to provide a, a real thorough active police presence throughout the entire structure of the airport. Um, so whether it be adding bollards to protect from, from vehicle attacks, uh, blast mitigation, um, even, you know, how we can eliminate mass gathering in certain areas to protect us from, from mass casualty events, and even down to placement of cameras. You know, that, that's really important when it comes to adding security features to airport, hardening the target. And, uh, as far as creativity, it really allows us as a police department to be more creative in how we allocate our, our resources and our manpower across the airport to be more proactive uh, and, and focus more on community oriented policing rather than you know standing those fixed stationary positions all the time that we used to do in the past. So this document really helps us in, in building and creating a safer airport altogether um, as far as a resource management uh, is concerned. So yeah, it's, it's a great document. Yeah, thanks for that, Josh. Renee, how about you as a user and not just an author of documents like this? How do you use them in the industry? I, I, I think it's 
you know, I, I think it's, it's fantastic because it, it, it helps provide um, a bit of framework. You know, it, it gives that, um, and, and Jeremy sort of touched on it, it gives that uh, validity behind sort of recommendations and guidance, um, which I, I think is, is sort of key in, in our industry where, um, you know, I think, I think sometimes things are up for interpretation. Um, so to have a document like this that's, that's recognized, um, you know, by, by Safe Skies or, you know, by any sort of agency that puts it out, I think really helps design professionals be able to justify, you know, guidance and recommendations. Um, you know, the, the reality is I think security is always struggling for dollars, um, you know, whether it's design money, construction money, or, or operational money, um, there's, there's, a, there's a battle for it. Um, and it's, it's often a very tough battle, um, you know, and, and in, in COVID times like we're in right now, I, I think that battle's become even more difficult. Um, so, you know, having, having structured guidance documents um, with the, 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 the shoulds and coulds as opposed to the shalls, um, you know, allows clients that I work with that flexibility so that we can have those conversations with, you know, I, I can sit down with, with Josh and, and have those conversations about policing and say, you know, look, we, we can't afford, you know, to add more cameras at this point, which is what sort of the guidance is saying, but, you know, can we add more, you know, can you adjust your, you know, your police, you know, walk path so that they pass this area more than this many times a day um, or, or vary it up, you know, so it, it gives that, that flexibility to uh, achieve a security intent with not necessarily in spending, um, you know, capital dollars that may or may not be available at this moment. So, you know, as, as an engineer, uh, I would say, you know, at times I like the shoulds um, because it makes, you know, what we need to do very easy. Um, but documents like this that are the shalls and the recommended, um, you know, I think enables us to, to provide and, and introduce that, that creativity um, and take those lessons learned as we start talking to, you know, our domestic and international airports that have had similar experiences and say, you know, we, we could try this. This is an interpretation of how we can meet this, whether it's a requirement, a guideline, um, or, or an airport security plan that defines a certain need behind it. So. You know, I, I think it it certainly makes it it makes it easier, um, you know, and I, I think really the core is that is the credibility factor, um, you know, really brings it back. And, it's, and especially the way Safe Skies does it, um, how the documents are viewed and vetted. Um, I think it adds another level of credibility to, you know, anytime this type of document gets referenced out there. Yeah, thanks for that, Renee. And I think that really um, goes back to the panel, like you said, that is sort of reviewing and scoping these documents and making sure that the airport perspective um, is taken into account and it isn't just from a design and engineering perspective, but it really is from a practical, how can this be applied in an airport? And so really that goes back to the good work that project panels do and making sure that it is going to be relevant and practical for them at their airport. So uh, good, good thoughts there. Um, I want to think ahead a little bit to, you know, maybe what is the next version of this? What might that look like? You know, obviously, this version has evolved over 25 years to get to this point, and it has evolved because the threat has evolved over that time, right? So I'm wondering, you know, I want to hear your outlook on how are security systems and the design advances going to continue to respond to evolving threats moving forward? You know, what current threats or threats do you see on the horizon that might impact design considerations in the next version of this document? Um, obviously, we can't ignore the pandemic. Um, even though that really is more, I would say, on the safety side than security, um, it is going to impact current and future projects. So I want to get your thoughts on, obviously, not just the pandemic, but what other things do you feel like are going to impact the next version of this document and really kind of drive where security systems um, and de design is going to advance moving forward? So, Jeremy, do you have thoughts on that? Sure. It's. I mean, it's right now we're we're on the tail end, hopefully, of the pandemic and and things uh, related to passenger, how the passenger views the airport is going to be, I think, uh, an important part of 
of how we move forward. Certainly uh, security checkpoint areas, the congestion there, will passengers feel safe in that, in that space? Um, and uh, you know, looking, looking at those areas and, and how we can better protect them. Um, certainly technology is uh, going to play a, a, a continued significant role. Um, how we how we secure access points throughout a terminal, um, and uh, you know the various technologies. I mean, we really are still seeing card access control pin pin pads being used. Um, uh, there are airports, uh, you know, at Albany, we utilize the iris scan system, which was very uh, very forward thinking. You know, back when it was originally put in. Um, you may see you may see more of that technology um, out there, uh, but um, I think uh, the, the bigger the bigger immediate uh, uh, issue will be trying to get people draw them back to the airport um, and making sure that they feel uh, safe where they're at, not only from a health and safety you know standpoint, from uh, just a, a physical uh, feeling, but also. Um, being able to secure the uh, secure the facility, and um, you know, when we go into design, that's going to be something that's going to be looked at. And we don't know that for certain. Uh, you know, if your airport has a, a certain number of employments or a certain allocation for space, um, is is the space allocation going to be the same in the future? Are we going to have footprints that are are the same? How will that impact? The security side of things, you know, larger spaces, more openings. Um, I know in the in the uh, in the uh, the guidelines, we 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 looked at that. We looked at a hardening of certain areas. How will that be viewed now? How will airport uh, boards or commissions or the cities that manage them um, are they willing to put forth uh, the budgets to? Have these increased areas, and how will the how will they be funded? So there's there's a lot of different things in the mix. It's and it all generally revolves around finances, uh, unfortunately. But um, I think those are some of the things that we're going to have to look at. Josh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think uh, I think proliferation of, of the pandemic and global illnesses that's kind of the low hanging fruit, obviously, uh, especially since we're just now coming out of it. So I, I think that will be considered. But uh, as far as the you know what's the next big threat, that's sort of the sky's the limit, right? Uh, we're we really need to to focus on using our imagination to figure out what the next big threat's going to be. Um, right now, there's a lot of focus. Uh, an effort being put on counter UAV programs. I think that's uh, something that can be incorporated in design and, and construction, especially you know around the airfield. Um, one concern that I have is, is everything that we build now. It seems it, uh, has connectivity to something. You know, it, it, into that whole the, the concept of the Internet of Things is becoming a real big deal, and uh, so. Anything like messaging boards, bathrooms, uh, you know, ut up to utilities, fence lines, anything with a sensor or a screen uh, is connected to a server somewhere. Uh, so obviously, there's a potential of vulnerability to cyber attacks. So I think that's one big thing that we need to look at. Um, so adding, you know, resiliencies and redundancies into systems uh, within the planning and design phase. You know, starting that early on uh, in the discussion is really should be a, a big focus. Um, you know, our current guideline does have uh, some sections about that, about IT security and things like that. But uh, I think in the future, future revisions will have a lot more to say about it. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's just kind of up to us and using our, our imaginations on figuring out what the next big threat's gonna be. But it, it's something to, to talk about. Yeah, thanks for that, Josh. Renee, what are you thinking about how this is gonna evolve moving forward? Oh yeah. It, so. I think as a, as an engineer who likes playing with stuff, it's gonna it, it's gonna pain me to say this, but I actually think the technical sections are gonna get smaller. Um, you know, we're gonna be less prescriptive about what a camera is and how a camera works, um, and and it's really gonna be about bolstering that front end section about the planning. Um, so you know, I I see and and I'm starting to see it now, especially with with a lot of capital projects. You know, security is being looked at right from day one now. Um, you know, so looking at that integrated design approach, um, you know, looking at how vehicles are approaching, you know, the airports, um, you know, we're, we're looking at 
at projects where they're they're trying to eliminate vehicles in 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 the front of the building. Um, you know, so really kind of taking into account, you know, how can we become more creative um, in the in the security design and move some of those low hanging known threats away from the building, you know, so that we can start mitigating it and not have to uh, spend excessive f funding and budgets on, uh, you know, hardening facilities or, you know, other other means and methods that sort of, you know, take away the beauty of some of these newer, more modern terminals. Um, and also at the same time, you know, our, our aging infrastructure, you know, being able to, you know, make potential minor changes like that you know, helps in, you know, looking at, you know, getting some more lifetime out of a terminal um, in order to increase that security uh, posture and perspective for that building. Um, so, you know, I, I really see, you know, that that integrated design concept uh, being being stressed, stretched and pushed a lot more um, in the future as, as new, new, new buildings are uh, being designed and developed. And, and I think as an industry, we need to kind of start thinking about that. You know, how do we get in with those with with the architects and the design firms and really start thinking about, um, you know, the, there was the big push for circular runways. You know, what what is the circular runway for the aviation security business? You know, what is that next creative thing that we need to start thinking about and be forefront about? And I really think that's going to be the new new sort of front end section. Um, I'll, I'll, I'm also going to just echo echo Josh's uh, comments about the UAS. Um, you know, I, I think the UAS threat is is one that is just going to get worse, um, not not better. Um, you know, and and some of it is is um, you know it's just an, it's an easy threat. Um, so we've got that, and I think the other thing that um, you know we need to look at, and I know I know Safe Skies has a has an RFP out there uh, on the street right now for that. You know, is really looking at the UAM threat. Um, you know, that is going to really you know change our airspace. Um, you know, when, when these companies, the Uber Air and Uber Taxi get off the ground, figuratively and literally, um, you know, what is that going to look like? You know, now it, it's just, it's bigger drones carrying people, um, you know, so where are they coming in? How are they entering our airports? How are they entering our airspace? Um, you know, I, I think that's going to be the other, um, you know, security aspect that really needs to be looked at and what those policies and procedures need to be. Um, I mean, obviously, the FAA is struggling with that right now. I think us as an industry is struggling with it. And I don't think there's a good answer out there. Um, but as we are looking at sort of master planning a lot of our airports, um, I think it's behooven to us to bring that that issue out there and start saying, you know, are you going to have are you going to have a, a UAM pod station somewhere at your airport? Um, you know, and what does that really mean? So. You know, I see that being that future looking technology that will need to be addressed um, in the next version uh, when this document gets re-looked at. Yeah, that's a really good point, Renee. And I think that is something that uh, was really the catalyst for the project that you're uh, referencing, which is uh, Paris 41, um, Security Considerations for UAM Operations at Airports. So that really is, um, trying to identify the questions that will need to be answered before these uh, this technology can begin operations at an airport. You know, we don't want to be playing catch up in the way that we have been with UAS. So if we can identify those questions on the front end and identify those security concerns so that the technology providers and developers and those who are, you know, really sort of deciding the operating structure for that technology, if they're aware of those concerns and roadblocks on the front end, they can start planning um, into their operating model how they're going to address those. So um, that really is the catalyst for that project and hopefully will help us not have to play catch up like we have been with UAS. So yeah, that's a really great point. And also wanted to get your thoughts on, um, obviously there is money um, that some airports have had access to for a pandemic recovery and more may be coming. I'm wondering what should airports be doing now to prepare for and anticipate potential funding that they could be putting into 
to projects in the future. Obviously, you know, from a consultant perspective, I think it's important, you know, to know, um, you know, what role you may be playing, but then also from the airport perspective, you know, what can they be doing now to kind of think through and plan for that? Renee, any thoughts on that from you first? Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I will say for, for our, the airport partners that are on the line, if you don't have a security master plan, um, now is a really good time to put together a security master plan. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're working with a, a number of airports right now where we, we've asked that question and it's, it's the, well, yeah, we have one, it's a bit dated. You know, if you're in that boat and you feel like you're in that boat, now's a good time to take it off the shelf and dust it off and, and, and rehab that study done. Um, because the reality is, is, you know, not only is funding going to be available you know, hopefully soon. I think we're all kind of keeping our fingers crossed. Um, I, you know, I think my concern right now, <clears throat> you know, and, and a lot of the, the financial analysts have, you know, there was stories this morning coming out about it, you know, looking at a period of potential inflation and, and the value of stuff costing more, um, you know, it, it gives us this opportunity in the next, you know, six, eight, 10 months to really set that framework to set a, a good plan. Um, you know, I, I think nothing is nothing is worse than going out and spending money to spend money and then kind of finish the project and go, oh, I wish we did, um, you know, and, and that master plan concept really provides that, you know, that one, five, 10 year outlook plan, and then how it overlays with, you know, whether there's an overall airport master plan and IT master plan, um, you know, making sure that those documents are, are well inter intertwined and interweaved with each other um, to ensure that when that funding does become available, it's, it's, done smartly, um, effectively, and efficiently, um, and, and not just a reaction to, um, you know, we need more cameras, you know, really kind of thinking about the intent of what's behind that and what the overall, you know, I think system impacts are. Um, so, you know, I, I, as an industry, you know, I, I think we're in a, a good point of, we're in a planning stage right now. Um, and, it, and it's really a good opportunity sort of as we're coming out the other side of COVID and um, you know, catching our breath um, from that, that tidal wave, you know, to really kind of take that pause and, and look at what the roadmap looks like. Um, and, and if not, you know, start planning on establishing that, that roadmap so that you have that, that clear funding, um, funding path and funding plan. Um, the other thing too, is that if you are going to be going after funding sources, um, having that roadmap on the front end makes it a lot easier um, than trying to find the fund and then trying to develop the plan. So if you've got that plan set in place, you know, it, it's, and I'm way oversimplifying this, um, but you can just really attach the plan to that funding request um, and it makes it a lot easier, um, you know, and, and just, you know, having, having that set up, I think now is, is really a, a really great opportunity um, for us, both on the consulting side, but I think also on, on, the, on the airport side. Jeremy, anything to add there? Yeah, I'd like to piggyback on the master planning process, not only from a security standpoint, but also from a from a from just an overall facilities and, and needs. I mean, I've had clients come to come to me and, and, and CHA and say, you know, we've gotten uh, Senator so-and-so or, you know, the governor's office is calling us on this project. Uh, what do you have? Are you, are you ready? you know, for, you know, can you put together a, just a high level brief or, and it's, and it's almost like um, some of our clients are being a little bit reactionary, which understandable, you know, they're running an airport, there's a lot of activity, there's a lot of things going on. Sometimes these things take a back seat, but um, being prepared and, and looking down and uh, looking into the future and, and just identifying uh, what could be done at your, your airport and uh, just something as sim simple as, you know, upgrading your card access control system or CCTV or, you know, evaluating uh, the layout of a, of a terminal or, you know, just think big. I mean, because you know what, you never know when those funding opportunities will present themselves. And certainly in New York State, uh, we've got uh, right now, there's, there's $100 million that uh, our, the governor's office is sitting on and that will come out at some point and they're going to put together a competition. So, um, you know, I don't know, uh, you know, how, how airports are, are positioned for things like this, but it's important. It's, it's be ready and, and, be, and think big because uh, if you can put together 
small little pieces to make a large project or tear it down and say, okay, uh, we'll fund an access control system here. We'll do a, you know, a security gate uh, here, a project. Be ready when the time comes because uh, sometimes those, those opportunities don't present themselves all that often and uh, you just want to be ready for when they do. Yeah, thanks for that, Jeremy. Josh, anything to add from the airport or public safety perspective? Yeah, just uh, just going off of what Jeremy and Renee said, uh, security master plan is a must. It's uh, it's really a needed asset for future planning and preparation. Um, but from a, a policing standpoint, you know we're always focusing on on new uh, funding availability, whether it be grant funding, government programs, or, or new budget initiatives. Um, and if you're an airport operator, you know that policing or your police service is probably one of the biggest expenses that doesn't bring in much, if any, revenue. Um, but it's also one of the most visible assets when it comes to safety and security of an airport. So uh, as passenger numbers increase, that means calls for service increase, arrests increase, and overall costs increase. So uh, anytime that we can look at available budgeting or, or available funding, uh, it's something that we really need to focus on. So uh, it's more of an operational standpoint. And from an airport perspective, you know, we don't we don't play as big a role in, in the overall uh, funding and planning, but but airport policing is expensive as it is, it's a necessity. Yeah, that is a really great point, Josh. Thanks for that. So we do have a few questions that have come in. Wanna make sure we get an opportunity to address those. So one was, um, what was the role, if any, of TSA on the project panel or project team? So I can tell you from the project panel perspective, we did have both TSA and FAA represented on the project panel. So they were involved in scoping the project um, reviewing deliverables along the way and including that final deliverable, providing um, input to make sure that obviously from a regulatory perspective, everything was correct, but then also just from an overall outlook perspective um, from TSA and FAA that um, the that the excuse me, the document was really reflecting their thinking as well. So they were involved um, on the project panel that way. Renee, was, was there any involvement on the uh, researcher team side of that? No, we, we tried to tread lightly um, on that because we did know that, that the TSA folks were on, were on the panel side. Um, so we, we did not want to reach out directly to them. Conversations we did have were just mostly confirming um, their existing standards and that we had the, the right versions um, and if there were any sort of behind the scenes that they could give us, if there was a new version coming out around the time we were delivering, um, that we could kind of sneak that in ahead of time. Um, and, it, and it didn't seem like timing of that was applicable. So that, that was our, you know, that's how we approached it. Yeah, thanks for that, Renee. Another question about passenger experience. How is the passenger experience being impacted by airport security technology and design? Anybody have thoughts on that, on the passenger experience? Yeah, so I can speak to that. Um, with anything, you know, change is, is seen as in some, some ways good and, and in some ways bad, but, um, you know, in the design phase and, and adding security uh, assets to the airport, we tried to minimize the impact uh, to passenger and, and customer experience as, as best we can um, to the extent that, um, I think a lot of passengers are aware that they're entering a secure facility. They, they should be, uh, you know, ready to see security features. And in some cases that makes them feel more safe. But in a lot of ways, we try to incorporate ways of, of masking those technologies and, and added features so that it really doesn't play uh, much into the experience at all. And Jess, I would just add to that, that, um, you know, as part of the security committee, I think it was early in the pandemic, early in quarantine, we asked TSA to come talk to us about what they were seeing, the impacts COVID was having on the passenger experience and, and changes to screening approaches. Um, and it was Keith Gall and Melissa Conley, if you'll recall, you know, they they took a they took an IOU to come back to us um, as as this is evolving for all of us, right? Nobody, there's no rule book for this. So 
um, TSA took a took a marker to come back to us. And so, um, you know, I can take that back to them and as maybe one of our, our summer meetings to say, let's revisit that conversation with them. What are they thinking are the, you know, what shape Renee said, you know, what shakes out of this? What, what do we what what do we take away from this long term? So um, I think that's a that's a timely conversation to, to ask them to come back and have with us. And Jessica, I would I would add, you know, I, th I think there's also a lot of um, I mean, there's, there's the obviously the checkpoint and the, you know, the, the queuing, what that looks like. And, you know, again, I think I think the obvious low hanging fruit. Um, but a lot of clients that I'm working with right now are, are really looking about, you know, that integrated technology approach. So, you know, how can we use cameras to apply analytics to start making smart decisions about how passengers are moving in the airports and improving the, the, the efficiency and effectiveness of how passengers move about? So, you know, whether that's, you know, alerting to a long queue line um, or, or realizing that there's too many passengers in a hold room um, and adjust dynamically the, the, the heating, the environmental conditions in that space. You know, I think there's some behind the scenes stuff that passengers are not sort of realizing, but it's, it's efficiencies where security can be part of that, that overall airport ecosystem um, and, and provide that, that better passenger experience. Um, you, you know, I, I think security is an interesting interesting thing and it was it was touched on sort of at the beginning of this meeting you know regaining passenger trust um, in the security and safety of airports um, you know we as professionals do a lot of things when we're designing the systems um, but unfortunately we can't have a big billboard that said you know this building is protected to this blast level um, you know do you feel safer um, you know that would be great if we could market that stuff um, you know and, and and I know Josh is like God please don't do that um, you know, but, you know, you know, we have to sort of think about those creative, you know, those creative aspects of security and, and those little give backs um, so that we do start regaining that that customer experience in the, in the overall process. Yeah, thanks for that. I have a question about um, we got a question about insider threat. And so I want to um, shift just a little bit. I'm going to share um, my screen for a PowerPoint slide. Hopefully, you all can see that. Um, the question was, what changes should be considered for protection against the insider threat, and what should airports and airlines know about staff? And so I wanted to point out um, on this slide, obviously here at skies.org, and then um, select Paris, you can view either our reports or our RFPs there. And so this report um, 26 insider threat mitigation at airports does get into a lot of discussion on um, information sharing and you know what aspects of um, your the personal lives of both airline and um, airport staff. What's realistic to know about your staff? Um, what are the ways that uh, you can really change the structure of your airport as well? Um, to address insider threats. So there is a lot of information there. And then also I um, wanted to point out uh, Paris 43, this RFP here that was just posted earlier this week, aviation security stakeholder information sharing. Um, that is really focused on what is the specific information that stakeholders can be sharing that has an impact on mitigating insider threats. So I feel like there's a lot of discussion and guidance available sort of theoretically about sharing information and creating insider threat working groups and that sort of thing. But this project, Harris 43, is really intended to drill down to what specific types of information should we be sharing? How can we share that? And what is the benefit to the industry overall for sharing that? Um, so just wanted to make sure that you knew those were available. Um, and then the other recent reports are listed there as well, um, as well as our op other open RFPs. But because those two um, speak directly to insider threat, I wanted to go ahead and, and show this slide um, and mention those. And panel, any other thoughts on insider threat? I know, uh, Josh, that's something that uh, is uh, dear to your heart as well. You have a lot of um, education and experience in that. And then also just from the public safety perspective, is there anything you'd like to add there? Uh, from a design and, and planning perspective, there's a lot of automated systems that are coming out, facial recognition and, and, and things like that that we can incorporate, of course. But um, in reality, insider threat, it just 
it just really gets down to the basics of getting to know your people. And I know at a CADEX airport where there's 60,000 employees, that could be you know difficult to do, but uh, really getting out there, talking to people, letting them know, you know, the see, see something, say something programs, uh, letting letting them know that there's an officer presence, uh, letting, you know, airport stakeholder management know that you need to understand who your people are and what they're doing from a day to day basis really plays into the insider threat mitigation. But yeah, design and, and construction um, insider threat does play a little bit into that, but it's more from an automated and technology systems perspective. Renee, any thoughts from you on that? Is there anything specifically in Paris 28 um, that you feel like addresses insider threat or anything outside of that? N no, not, not specifically. Um, we, we were, again, sort of knowing that there was a dedicated one coming out. We didn't want to touch too much um, on that. Uh, I, I mean, I will say, um, you know, in, in insider threat, and I'll, I'll I'll tie it back to a, another Paris report that I, I worked on in a previous life, um, the security management systems, the SEMS program, you know, really goes into looking at the operational side of insider threat possibilities and how to mitigate those. So really looking at, you know, how, how, is, how, are, how are the people who are working in the ecosystem? Um, you know, where do they work? Where do they fit? And, you know, to give you that ability to potentially um, identify those early risks that could be, you know, within your, within your operating environment. Um, so yeah, that, that, that would be sort of the, I would say the split between the two, but I think the new document is, is going to be much more honed in on that specifically. Yeah, we have another question and I think it ties into this a little bit is, you know, with the rise of technology and automation and biometrics, um, you don't see that at the forefront, you know, as far as a passenger experience or really um, sometimes even from the insider perspective, you might not see what security is taking place. And to your point, you know, we're not going to put a sign out that says uh, this building is protected to the, this blast level. Um, and so, you know, the actual human contact aspect is the most visual. And so, Josh, to your point, too, about having, you know, a police presence and, and things like that um, in the terminal to provide more trust um, for passengers. Um, is there, I'm wondering, um, the, the responder is wondering, is there softer guidance um, in place in in this Paris discussion? Is, does it have a place in the Paris discussion um, about that sort of uh, more uh, visual aspects of security um, in the terminal? Josh, do you have any thoughts on that, on the more visual aspects of security or Jeremy as well um, about, um, is, that, is there a place for that in this sort of, uh, th either this document in the future or other Paris documents? Yeah, I think that could be touched on on the the uh, actual insider threat document that's being prepared, but um, it all it, it boils down to reassurance policing is kind of what I call it. You know, we're we're out there, we're being seen, visible, high presence. Uh, it it acts as a deterrent in, in both ways, either insider threat or from the passenger, um, out you know perspective. So we're we're out there, we're visible, um, either the checkpoints, walking on the public side, even the sterile side. Um, so employees and passengers both get to see us. Uh, get to be aware that we're, we're there. So it really provides reassurance to the passenger that this is a safe environment, that I'm not putting myself in danger by, by, by getting on an airplane. And from an employee perspective, it lets them know that police are in the area, they're, they're around, they're watching. So uh, probably shouldn't do anything that, that uh, could get me in trouble. I remember during our discussions, there was a lot of talk about, you know, uh, how, how, how to approach the design of certain types of facilities and the delicate balance between a form and function, the aesthetics of, of, of a building, of a terminal, of the, the, the area. I mean, people, when they go to an airport, they don't want it to be, you know, dark clad, you know, no windows, like a fortress. Um, and a lot of airport owners don't want that. They want it to be a, a beautiful facility that's it can be utilized and, and enjoyed and to really experience the, the, the actual travel experience itself overall. So I think it's, there is a balance between having something that's kind of in your face, if you will, as far as security is concerned. And I think law enforcement is, is one of those ways that does comfort people when they see somebody 
um, at the security checkpoint or walking through the uh, the terminal with a with a uh, a dog, you know, or something like that. I think that's it puts more of a personal feel to it rather than having just you know big walls and and uh, you know all these bollards out front and just completely walling off the place. So, and I know that was part of the discussion when we were putting this together. Um, was was that kind of that approach? You know, when we were talking about it originally. Renee, any other thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I was I was just going to make um, just just two final thoughts on that. One, I think one of the big things I've learned, um, you know, working at airports is, is to make sure, especially in the insider threat or just, just the threat um, mitigation programs in general, you know, a lot of airports have to see something, say something, um, you know, but forget to close the loop with the person who saw something, um, you know, so it, it's really key that when you have those programs and employees feel like they're being heard and then they're, you know, reapproached afterward and saying, you know, thanks for reporting that. Um, we investigated and it turned out to be nothing, or thanks, you reported that, we found this out, um, you know, it, it re-engages the employees in that process, um, you know, and, and having them be, um, you know, really key and part of the overall security program. Um, I, I'll, I'll give a shout out to, to, to DFW, um, you know, they, they have the, you know, the, the orange jackets, um, you know, they're, they're part of security, um, you know, they're really there for customer experience and customer um, you know, assistance and helping. But, you know, when, when, when we've been down there and we, we've worked with DFW and, you know, they know what's going on at the airport. They know when something's out of place, you know, so they can be that secondary line of eyes and ears in the field. So, you know, really taking a, you know, a look at what the assets are that you have available and, you know, making sure they have that empowerment and feel empowered to be part of um, assisting the overall security program. Yeah, thanks Renee. The the concentric circles of security, you know, the, the customer experience personnel are, are part of those concentric circles. So where one system may have some some breaks in security, other systems are in place to to cut, you know, bring up the slack and, and really hone in on issues that we may be seeing. So hmm. thanks for that. Sure. Yeah, so we're rapidly approaching um, 1230, but one final question and want to bring uh, maybe Cassie or TJ back in on this as well. Um, if there's the question of, can you be more specific about possible funding? So I know we've mentioned, um, a few of you have mentioned funding that um, may be available soon. Any specifics that you can give on, on any of that? TJ, can I defer to you on that one? Essie, can I defer to you? No, <laughs> ping pong it back and forth. No, um, so obviously, um, big ticket item here is Washington and the Congress and the administration and the annual appropriations process. And um, you know, we have to be mindful at this time of certainly we're um, interested in TSA deploying next generation, you know, equipment. Uh, that will reduce the amount of touches and, and things like that, better uh, detection capabilities. Uh, soon we'll be talking about, you know, really a need to recap EDS and inline baggage systems and things like that. Um, but at the, at the end of the day, you know, look at staffing. Uh, TSA is trying to hire thousands of new uh, security officers to handle growing demand. And um, I think labor has the ear of this administration for sure. So there's always that inherent push and, and tension between you know, equipment and people. Um, <clears throat> but at the end of the day, that gets sussed out in annual appropriations processes. Uh, what we're trying to do at ACC, and I think in conjunction with AAAE and ACI is, you know, is there anything above and beyond the appropriations process? Uh, first and foremost, um, a portion of the security fee that's collected by uh, passengers gets diverted to the general fund uh, for deficit reduction. We're trying to do what we can to get that back into TSA for security purposes. And then we really need to keep in mind uh, the infrastructure, the interest on the infrastructure. Um, certainly we're focused on airports in general, we're focused on terminals. Um, and I think there's certainly opportunities to bring in um, opportunities for discussion, uh, discussion on, on security as well. Uh, monies to uh, enhance uh, physical security uh, throughout uh, the terminal and the airport environment. Again, uh, EDS recapitalization. So again, you know, certainly 
we and AAAE and ACI are um, looking at opportunities to increase you know, funding for security above and beyond what we get in the appropriations. So I think one of the things that I can I can add to that, um, and, and TJ, we can work together on our, our request of our friends at TSA for another visit with us, is exactly what you just said. What are they expecting for, for out your funding um, for technology, for enhancements? Um, see what they're what they're forecasting. Um, and you know, where they think things are are gonna flush out. We can, you know, we can certainly ask that. Okay, we are right Thanks at 12. Absolutely. I was just gonna mention also, Cassie, that we will have um, a link to this recording available on the Safe Skies website. And so as soon as that's available, we will let everyone know that that's there. Perfect. Um, the Safe Skies website is a wealth of information um, if folks are not aware. So I would encourage anyone to go spend some time on there. So thank you, Jess. Okay, TJ, should we wrap it up? Let's wrap it up. Okay. Well, thank you everyone. Always a tremendous thank you to the Safe Skies team, um, the team that, that worked on this report. Uh, this was, I think, uh, tremendously informative and helpful. Um, so thank you all. Thank you for your participation. Um, and always thank you to ACC for providing this forum. So everyone have a wonderful day and don't forget Mother's Day is Sunday. So call your mama. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.